So it is 11 a.m. on the east coast of the United States, uh, 8 a.m. on the west coast of the United States, and uh, evening in Europe, very early or very late, depending on where else you are in the world, in Asia and other places. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Barry Slaughter Olson. I am the uh, co-president of Interpret America, and my colleague, Catherine, go ahead. Hello, I'm also co-president of Interpret America. I'm Catherine Allen. And uh, we would like to share a little bit with you today. Um, we've got a lot to share with you, actually. But what I want to do first is walk you through the Interpret, uh, the Kudo platform that we'll be using today for our grand finale. So um, you will see that on the lower left-hand corner, there is a language selector. And if you click on that it will give you a pop-up list of different languages available today. Today we have available English, Spanish, and American Sign Language. So uh, feel free to use that interpretation. We will introduce our interpreters shortly. Um, quickly again to let you know that the messaging tab Use the participants tab to say hello to everyone, to ask questions, to share comments and what have you. And the operators tab, if you have any kind of glitch or a problem and our technicians, Michael and Robert will be able to assist you. Um, and the private messaging tab is available to you as well. So you can send messages to specific people if you would like. I do see that I'm looking a little pixelated yep. again. And uh, normally what I do for that is maybe because I'm using a 4K camera and it's having to downsize. So I'm going to turn that off just briefly. And we'll see if that improves things a little bit. It has somewhat. We'll hope it improves as we go along. But let's go ahead and dive right in. Um, I'm going to share our slide presentation. Just let me get that started. And share my screen. And here we go. Folks, the end is just the beginning. We've introduced ourselves, and you've probably seen our faces and heard our names more, many, more, more times than you can count. A uh, big thank you to Kudo for allowing us to use the platform for our event today. We are very grateful to them for making it available to us. I have a little bit of an inside uh, a track with Kudo now, as you know, so um, I was able to go right to the top and ask for permission. Wanted to point out our languages, as we've already said, and we want to thank our interpreters. Our interpreters today are Joe Rivera and Nicholas Markin for American Sign Language, and for Spanish and English, uh, Maria Florencia Scarpino and Yanni Monroy. We want to thank them. You'll notice that you can download in uh, from the Documents button a uh, this slide, and if you would like to take a look at their uh, profiles to see... Um, you know, where they work, and language combinations and other things like that, those are available. So please feel free to download that from the Documents button. I'll turn it over to Catherine now. Okay, well, we want to really, we have a whole bunch of special guests that will be coming on today, and this is a slide is showing everybody who you'll be hearing from. Um, of course, we wish this could be many, many times over because Interpret America was always just a full of collaboration. I mean, we, everything we did was about collaborating with people from all across the profession, but we're very honored today to have this group of people who are going to be speaking to you briefly um, in just celebrating what we did over the last 12 years. So for today's program, we're going to just go through the early days and share a little bit of information about, you know, why we're here and how we got where we are. And uh, we'll also have a few other folks come in. We have a special guest, Robert Hamm, filmmaker, um, and he's going to talk a little bit about the Interpreter Film Project that we backed back in 2015 and where that stands today. We're going to look at technology, and then we're going to look at the collaborations that we did and the advocacy. And with that, we'll wrap up, and our hour and a half will be gone. In fact, we're letting you know now that if we are able to do this as expeditiously as possible, will probably still take an extra 10 minutes. So just letting you know as we've been trying to fit all of these things in. So let's take it away with the early days. You know, why are we here today? 
Well, we're here to celebrate. This is this is a celebration for the next hour and a half. And what we want to do is simply recognize that Interpret America is signing off after more than a decade of conferences and advocacy and writing and all of the things that we have done. And we basically set out to accomplish what I have to try this again. You'll see I'm a little nervous today because this is a pretty emotional day for us. Um, we have set, we have accomplished what we set out to accomplish. We wanted to get the profession talking to each other and about itself. We wanted to see collaboration among professional associations. We wanted to see a more organized advocacy of the profession. And we wanted to see as well how the language services industry as a whole could have more collaboration and dialogue. And we wanted to draw attention to technology. Yeah, big surprise coming from me, I know. <laughs> um, and we knew that it was going to impact and disrupt our profession, um, as we have seen in the last uh, 12 months. And in short, what we wanted to do was raise the profile of interpreting. We didn't make all of this happen but we just wanted to be a part of it. And to the extent that we helped it along, we are very proud and, and thankful to have been able to do that. All right. So I would also just like to add to that, that, um, you know, what, you know, we, Sorry, I'll get myself coherent here. So one of the reasons why we are closing our doors is because, you know, we, we, we have also evolved in our profession and Barry has taken a position with KUDO, um, which no longer allows us to be the Switzerland of interpreting, which we, you know, worked hard to position ourselves with, you know, over the last 12 years. Um, but in, and in the end, yes, I could have carried the platform on by myself, but I just have to say right at the beginning that this was always a Barry and Catherine show it was a very unique partnership between the two of us. It's sort of been one of the great journeys of my life. And so in the end, it just felt like we needed to honor what we had done together. And, and we can, we'll, we're not going anywhere. We're both clearly going to stay involved in the profession. Um, but it's time. This was our, our gig, our thing together. So it didn't feel right to carry it on without that. Um, yeah. So, sorry, Barry. <laughs> can we oh, go, back, go back to our, 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 where we're, our program. And uh, to do that, we have a slide up there that said, if not now, when? And that is kind of how we felt back in 2008 when I had just uh, started at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies. Um, Catherine was actually one of my graduate students. And I saw that her in knowledge of healthcare and community interpreting complemented very well my knowledge of conference interpreting. And we wanted to bring the entire profession together. And so we, I pitched this idea to her and um, we basically decided that we were going to create a national summit. Now, I do need to mention very quickly that in 2007, the seed of this idea started in Buenos Aires, Argentina, where I was invited to speak at the Interpreta 2007 or the Inter uh, Interpreta 2007 conference that was organized by Lucille Barnes and by Jose um, Villanueva Senchuk. Um, I thought, after seeing interpreters together in Buenos Aires and all that they were doing, I said, we need something like that in North America. And that's how it started. And that's what eventually led us to uh, walk off of a cliff, yep. uh, not literally, but financially and in a lot of other ways. Right. <laughs> No, when we planned the first summit, we literally signed a hotel contract for thousands of dollars and commissioned a report for more than $20,000, which we'll get to in a moment, with the zero registration, zero program, and zero sponsors. <laughs> so it was a true leap into the unknown and a leap of faith. That's right. And now we have had seven successful summits on interpreting, including the one that uh, emerged at the beginning of the pandemic last year in 2020. And it has been an amazing ride. But to introduce uh, one of our, our first guests, um, uh, Seabreeze, if you would go ahead and uh, request to speak. I'll let you on, and we want to introduce Seabreeze Osborne. 
who was basically the nerve center of Interpret America. She was the one that kept us on track and kept us organized and explained to us the whole process of negotiating with hotels. She basically helped us survive that first summit and then thrive in the following summits. And as a way to explain how important Seabreeze was to us, she was the only other person with an Interpret America credit card in her wallet. <laughs> so Seabreeze, we just wanted to go ahead and give you a few minutes to, to share um, you know, your thoughts. And I'm going to start our timer and we're going to give you three minutes. So it's all yours. Thank you. Well, that, <clears throat> excuse me, that credit card was definitely my most favorite credit card in my wallet. As I looked at the blog post that you had of everything you have accomplished in the last 10 years, I saw a picture of, a, of us at the very first conference. And my first thought was, we all look exactly the same. <laughs> You're so kind. <laughs> so looking back and working with you guys, um, what really impressed me and what I really appreciated working with Catherine and Barry on was their attention to detail. From deciding what kind of appetizers to be had because they knew conference food, they knew how much you guys endured conference food. So their <laughs> detail to what kind of appetizers and food needed to be down, done, all the way down to the program guide margins. They would be able to tell if the guy, if the margin was off just a millimeter. <laughs> I couldn't believe they could tell, but yet they were right as I brought up the measuring stick. <laughs> but also their attention to detail to ensuring that everyone was involved, that everyone was representative and had a voice. Working with them, it was clear from the very beginning that they have a passion and a gift for this community and for this profession. They were truly interested in others' opinions and point of view. They had endless energy talking to everyone, ensuring that everyone's voice was heard and that the conversation would continue. And I could tell this by who they involved in, in creating the agenda, making sure that the agenda had equal time for everyone, making sure that they had the breaks in the agenda, the networking events and, and receptions in the evenings, so everyone could talk to everyone. I couldn't believe the amount of endless energy that they had in the planning and the day of the conferences. I would show up bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, but pretty tired from getting everything ready, and I got to sit down and relax. That's when you guys were just at a go time, and I would watch and wonder with just and appreciate, again, the passion that you had for this community and profession. And finally, but most importantly, what I felt from you guys constantly, and I know other people did as well, is you were truly appreciative of everyone you worked with, from the hotel staff to the presenters and to me. We would show up often the day before to do a walkthrough and get everything ready for the conference, and you would come with a gift for me, thanking me for my help when I would be just so happy that I would be there. I felt like I was there just along for the ride. So thank you so much for letting me be a part of this and and getting to know more about you and your professions and and, and interpreting the world. Thank you. Awesome, Seabreeze. Thank you so much. Thank it is so much. a pleasure. And of course, our friendship will definitely continue. But um, I can always remember at the different summits, people would say, so where's Seabreeze? Oh. Is Seabreeze here today? Is yeah. Seabreeze going to be here this year? Yeah. <laughs> so you definitely were a significant part of the summits. And so oh, thank you very thank much. I will miss seeing everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to keep moving forward. And I'll share slides here again. And... Uh, Take me just a moment. There we go. And as we said, seven successful summits. We've talked about those, California, Washington, D.C., back and forth from coast to coast, and then online last year where we had over 1,300 registrants for the uh, Interpret America 2020 conference, a unified response to ensure access to interpreting services. Um, we'll talk more about how technology has influenced us, but... Um, I think it's time for us to move on now to one of our other collaborations. Catherine, do you want to talk about a little bit about Think Interpreting? 
Yeah, we're going to be um, getting to talk with Allison Furt from Gala about Think Interpreting, but this was our first our first new and additional collaboration we did in the conference space where we would we were invited to try to bring in interpreting content into the globalization and localization association which was the world's large is the world's largest um professional association for business companies in in the in in the language industry space so I, we started in 2014 and carried on all the way through this year always having events that are amazing but let's hold talk about that a little bit more and, and move through because um, I want to be sure we have time to get to our first Mentimeter slide, Barry. That's right. We'll briefly touch on the next collaboration, which was Lenguas, which is a more recent collaboration with Gonzalo uh, Salorio Moraita and the Italia uh, Moraita Foundation. And we will also be talking about that a little later on in the program, but this is one of our most special collaborations. <clears throat> and also just a really quick, you know, um, if you move on to the next slide, Barry, we just also want to acknowledge this is that we had so many partners and so many collaborations and we can't acknowledge all of them. And if we've left anyone out, we're very sorry. Um, but this we've, you know, through the years, we've done so much with the Association of Language Companies and with uh, the American Translators Association and many other professional associations and with Indigenous Interpreting and with the, you know, some of the vendors and, and technology companies and with cross-cultural communications and many, many more. So we just want to be sure we at least acknowledge you um, and and say thank you um, for that. And it just, it was part of our hallmark. And I'll let you take this one, Barry. Yeah, and as we started, even from the very first summit, we realized that there were basically three things that were driving us. Connection, technology, and advocacy. And we're going to frame the rest of our presentation or our, our, our meeting today around these three things. Um, but we want to give you a chance to let us know what you think. And so we are going to make use of Mentimeter. So we would encourage you to go to menti, M-E-N-T-I dot com. And uh, you're going to put in this number, 70 12 66 3. And I am going to actually get to that. Oh, forgive me. I've got to get, uh, there we go. Um, did I? Oh, give me just one second. There it is. Now you should see it and I'll present and we're all started. I'm going to give you, we're going to give you three words to describe Interpret America. What comes to mind when you hear Interpret America? What are those three words? Go ahead and just drop them in there. Yep, there we go. We up with. And Thank be you. nice. We yeah, know. Right. Nice. <laughs> and the code is at the top of the page. It's yes. 70, 12, 66, 3. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you, you should be able to see it. And we'll get this word map going. I remember when Barry first pitched to me, hey, there's this cool tool called Mentimeter. Barry's always the one who was bringing in the new tech and, and paying attention to it. And, and so we... Um, decided we would give it a try, you know, to have a live slide like this going on, uh, you know, as, as, as asking questions and sort of getting the pulse of the um, audience, because it's always so frustrating having so much expertise and amazing colleagues present and not always being able to have as much interaction or connection. So this is wonderful. <clears throat> okay, we're going to give another 30 seconds to go ahead and Drop in those words, and we'll go back and look at these a little bit later. And uh, very honored to have Professional be the uh, biggest The biggest there. one, yeah. Collaboration, collaborative. Wow, thank you guys. Advocacy. Um, For sure. We've got another so 10. We have a little gift to us. <laughs> you guys are giving a gift to us on the way out um, just to have it. This is a memento. Thank you so much. And and even when we stop sure. showing the screen, you, you you'll can keep putting more in if you'd like. All right. Well, our time has run out, so we're going to move on to our next one. And it's time to hear from some of our special guests. So, Catherine, um, I think you're going to kick it off. Yeah, so we are still focused a little bit on just sort of our early days and our origins. And these three, uh, excuse me, these four women, Marjorie Bancroft, Naomi Bowman, Kristen Quinlan, and Ka uh, Caitlin Walsh, just were hugely in instrumental in um, supporting us right from the beginning. So I think that maybe we'll just bring them up in that order and, and I can introduce Marjorie for a moment. And if, and I think you're going to start, Marjorie, assuming we've got your sound solved. But I 
Marjorie, I, many of you know in the field that, you know, we've collaborated on many, many projects and she's certainly been a huge mentor and someone who's responsible for bringing me up in the field and helping me, you know, get to where I've gotten. So uh, when we started this crazy idea, we didn't know each other that well. We were just getting to know each other, but Marjorie had just published the Interpreters World Tour and um, we brought her in at the very first conference to speak on it and, um, to, you know, about ethics and standards in, in the interpreting and profession. And then you also, the second one, you had a crazy, uh, um, uh, presentation that you help put together with acting like you do and just you just supported us all the way through so I'm going to hand it off to you. Um, I, first of all thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to say right now I can't believe it's been 10 years and the first summit like the very first IE summit the, it was such a landmark experience for me personally. The mood was intense, the crowd was warm but loud and excited and and I was on right for community interpreting still am and that was practically a dirty phrase back then and you guys paired me to speak with Diane de la Terra like the former dean of the most prestigious U.S. master's program for conference interpreting uh, at what used to be called the Monterey Institute for International Studies and she just turned out to be spectacularly warm and respectful of community interpreting it was such a bonding experience but also emblematic of the whole day because all day medical conference community legal business educational humanitarian remote military interpreters and the people who support them we all just came together in this like this one big room in washington dc and by the end of the day i really remember this vividly we had bonded so deeply and warmly that when you two stood up together to thank us um we gave them a, we gave you guys like a standing ovation and i looked up at the two of you going they're like this perfect pair to lead us to this place and since then over the last 10 years you guys brought us out of our silos just like to talk to each other like no one else did and no longer is court or conference or medical or military whoever interpreters but as interpreters and everyone else who supports interpreting and and I just want you to look 10 years later at, at the results because you were sowing seeds, you spread the word, and that was kind of the beginning of what brought us all together to, to share and care and grow together as a, as a profession and, and an industry and a whole. Because before that, you know, we were like the, the fingers of two hands without a palm to connect us and <laughs> interpret America. You were like, you helped us to connect. So we have learned so much from you guys that we are the, a fabric, like the tapestry of a profession. And it's beautiful, but it will fray if we don't work to weave it into a whole. We've learned that we are so much stronger together than apart. And even before the pandemic, we learned there is no way through this but together. Everything is changing too fast. We can't keep up. So thank you, Catherine and Barry, for all the gifts you have given us a forum to gather, a place to join hands, a call to arms, a voice for unity. Interpret America, you taught us that we are many and we are one and we are far more powerful for being one and that we who have lived and worked to give a voice to so many now, together we can give a voice to the profession. And, and for much of this experience of coming together, we can thank you too. So thank you, Interpret America, for all these precious gifts you've given to us, to me, and to the world. It, it, I really believe the profession is in a different place now, and, and you guys help make that happen. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Marjorie. Thank you Very so much, Marjorie. Today. Thank you. Well, we're going to go ahead and try to stay on track. And uh, next, I want to introduce Kristen Quinlan. Kristen, if you want to go ahead and turn on your camera. I think I did. Ooh. Ooh, there, there you are. are. Hi. Perfect. <laughs> Wonderful. Kristen Quinlan is the CEO of Certified Languages International. And that doesn't even begin to describe the support, the encouragement, the guidance that she has provided as we have gone along this last uh, journey over the last 10 years. Uh, Kristen and her father, Bill, um, showed up at the first conference, sat in the back at a table, and they had their new iPads, and they were busy sending all this stuff. And as we later found out, 
these folks from the uh, interpreting industry were really, what are these people doing? And should we get behind them? And once she attended that first conference, she never looked back. CLI has been one of our biggest supporters mm. over the last 10 years, and we would not have been able to innovate and do the things we did without Kristen's support. So, Kristen, thank uh, you for being with you. us. And You're we're going to give you, you three minutes to just share whatever you do. <laughs> okay. Well, I think it was spring, maybe March of, um, of 2010, when I stumbled across something called Interpret America. I don't know what platform it was, whether it was an email or whether it was social media. But anyway, stumbled across this Interpret America thing and that you're holding a one-day summit of sorts back in D.C. It had something to do with raising the profile of interpreting. And I thought, heck yes. Dad, my late father, Bill Graper, and founder of our company, I said, Dad, there's a new group who's getting together to talk about everything interpreting. The sponsorship opportunities is available. Should we go all in? And I think we were your first platinum sponsor. Um, anyways, yes. So, so we showed up just wide-eyed and bushy-tailed trying to uh, figure out what this was all about. Um, my company, CLI, is one of the largest providing uh, lar largest providers of interpreting. At the time, we focused solely on OPI. And my philosophy is not to strictly grow top-line revenues, but to grow our company to be among the highest quality interpreting companies in the nation. Reputation for quality is everything to me. And innately, I needed to be involved in the industry and be part of the conversation. And Interpret America was just the thing we needed. Um, I'm a huge proponent of raising the awareness of interpreting uh, the profession, the professionalism, and the industry. And back then, really, nobody talked about interpreting in a, in a significant way. Uh, conference interpreters were in league of their own. And on the other end of the scale, there was industry. Those of us who had the reputation of profiting on the backs of hardworking interpreters, we were the bottom feeders. And I didn't want to be a bottom feeder. I wanted to be involved in a way that changed that perception. Uh, the very first conference, I made some of the most really interesting connections, tech developers, interpreters, language companies, industry associations. Everyone was there together to connect about all things interpreting. It was amazing. And over the course of the next 10 years, we got to know each other and understand each other just a little bit better. Barry and Catherine were instrumental in bringing the scary topic of technology to the space. Everyone was afraid that tech would, in part or all, replace humans. We all know that nothing's farther from the truth, but Barry and Catherine, year over year, brought together developers, users, linguists, and unified them all. Today, it's commonly understood that technology actually is helping the world of lang language access and interpreting grow, which is true. Barry and Catherine went out on a limb. You guys took a huge chance, and you guys single-handedly unified the wide world of interpreting. And for that, I'm forever grateful. Barry and Catherine have become very dear friends. I've leaned on them both professionally and personally. We've gotten to know each other's families. And I'm sad to see this chapter close, but I know the future is bright because of you two. And I have your phone numbers. <laughs> Thanks so much. Chris. And uh, co-presidents, I yield back my 17 seconds <laughs> <laughs> with the theme of the week. <laughs> yeah, that's very good. Excellent. Thank you, Thank Kristen. You. Thank and you. it has been simply an amazing journey and mm -hmm. uh, looking forward to the next decade as well in new roles and new responsibilities, but still advocating and working to help the profession become all that it can in the 21st century. Absolutely. Thank you both. And thank I just you. want to thank you for all of your guidance and mentoring ah. over the years, too. I do. Yes. So thank here. you, Kristen. All right. Okay. Bye. Excellent. Thanks. And all right, Naomi Bowman. Naomi, if you'd like to turn on your camera and your, uh, your microphone. Um, I'm also going to take just a moment to introduce Naomi because uh, she and I have known each other for more much more than a decade. Um, she started to get uh, probably bothersome calls for me when I was a recent grad of the Middlebury Institute looking for work and figuring out how can I start to be among that elite group of interpreters that she worked with. Um, Naomi has always been someone who has kept her eye on technology and has been concerned about the reputation and the profile of the profession. Um, her dad, um, Bill Wood, we have two very important bills that have a lot to do with Interpret America, and Bill Wood was definitely one of them. Um, so, Naomi, you have been there with us from the very beginning. You supported us from day one all the way uh, through all of our summits, and we are very grateful. And we'd just like to, again, give you three minutes to share what's on your mind. Thank you very much, Barry. It's great to be here. And I want to share a few memorable moments 
with Interpret America, but I first want to say that Interpret America is so important to me because it was the first place where I could be in a big room with a whole lot of other people who understood what I did. It was the first time I could communicate with people who got me. We are in an obs a, a relatively obscure profession, and many of us struggle to explain what we really do to others, especially, especially those of us in the conference interpreting sector. And Interpret America really gave us a home. So I always felt like it was my event. <laughs> I felt like I was part owner of it. And you all made us feel that way. So a few key moments, 2011, Washington, DC. Um, I will never forget you providing my father with the opportunity to, to sit up there on that very intimate stage with people he felt so comfortable with. And he said his famous quote, which I hear all the time. And I'm trying not to get too emotional, but when you put that slideshow up, and I looked up and there was a picture of my father and it froze on the screen <laughs> for a couple of minutes. I thought, wow, that's my dad sending a sign. Anyway, Bill Wood, <laughs> 2011, Interpret America. Interpreters will not be replaced by technology. They will be replaced by interpreters who use technology. And we hear it all the time. In 2012, you awarded my dad with a Lifetime Achievement Award for uh, outstanding contributions to the field of interpreting, and he had suffered a pretty catastrophic brain injury uh, shortly, a, a few months before that, and that was the first time he was able to complete a sentence and remember who I was, and I credit that event for inspiring him to come back <laughs> to all of us. Was he that big um, lucid and as sharp as could be? Yes, <laughs> but he hadn't been until that very moment, and I'm not sure everybody really understood that. He didn't even know who I was. Um, he sure did from that point forward. His memory came back. Um, clients, we met one of our most important clients at one of your events, and I remember a competitor saying to me, why do you want to go to that event? Uh, and I told them why. And then I thought, oh, well, maybe you shouldn't come. <laughs> but we really wanted everybody to be there. And another competitor said to me with so much enthusiasm over lunch one day at the event, this is the place to be. If you're not here, you're crazy. You've got to be here to be somebody. This is the place to be. We connected with vendors. We connected with friends. We collaborated, but just to finish up, I want to say thank you to Catherine and Barry for your leadership and your inspiration. Because of you, you paved the way for so many of us to step up, lead, and make an impact. Thank you so much. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you. And that is one thing that I've seen. Uh, especially in the last 12 months, how so many people have stepped up and taken that leadership role to help guide people and help them through these tra this transition and this difficult time that we're facing. So, yeah. And you've done an amazing job, so thank you. And thank you for sharing that memory. I did not know that, so that's very moving to me. To, I mean, it's very, very moving. Thank you so much, Naomi. Well, um, thank you. I, Catherine, I'll let you go ahead and introduce Caitlin. Our final guest in this segment is Caitlin Walsh, and she's here in her former capacity as the um, former president of the American Translators Association. And we're not seeing your camera yet, Caitlin, so I'm not, we'll, we'll see what's going on. But in the meantime, I'll just say that in some ways, you're here for you, and you're also here representing all of the amazing uh, support we have received from the American Translators Association uh, throughout th this time as you know, sort of the national association in, in our field, but also it, to represent all of the collaboration and support we got from many professional associations throughout this time. You know, we just saw two uh, business owners come in and now, you know, hopefully we can get Caitlin back on and she can give her comments. But for me, 
personally, the journey was like, you know, I was in the world of professional associations and getting to know and sort of advocating for the profession on the community interpreting side. Um, and, and, but then I, through Interpret America, you know, really came to understand the business side of the our profession. And that's just for me, having this mix of people has been a real gift. So it's great to have you back on and um, thank you for everything you've done. And we'd love to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much for having me here. And I still remember the day when I realized that you and my midwife were college roommates. It was <laughs> one of those small world moments that really just clinched the deal. Yep. Um, so like you too, I've always believed that we are stronger together. If you don't have room at a table, you need a bigger table, um, that we're better when we're inclusive rather than exclusive. And I always thought that one of ATA's strengths was that it's this huge umbrella and there's room for everyone. So in 2012, um, seems like ages ago, um, I was running for president-elect of ATA. Our interpreters division had about 700 members. And part of my platform was to somehow find a way to create parity in terms of membership for our interpreter colleagues. But I'm a translator, right? I sit here in my little cave. Um, so first, I needed to learn about interpreting. I needed to learn the landscape. So um, flew down to Monterey, rented a car, and um, Christina Helmerichs took me by the hand and took me to the third Interpret America Summit in Monterey. I was so incredibly nervous because I didn't know the landscape. I didn't know the personalities. I was a translator in interpreter land. And you know what? I didn't need to worry because Catherine and Barry made me feel so welcome. Um, long story short, I had four years to get this done. ATA was faced with this incredibly divided landscape that was hard to understand. It made our efforts incredibly difficult. But by doing something revolutionary, by bringing their vision, Catherine and Barry brought together this highly siloed landscape into one place to talk to each other, not about their differences, but about their similarities. And the change over a decade has, is, is really stunning. I mean, interpreters know each other. They have colleagues in different areas. Organizations work together um, for like nearly five years. There's been a coalition of interpreting associations, including ATA, that have monthly phone calls. Don't know if people know that. Uh, interpreters are in ATA's tagline. Their credentials are recognized in the ATA directory. Um, it gives them voting membership in the association. And as a result, ATA is now the largest association of interpreters in the country. <laughs> Our interpreters division is the second largest division in the entire association and has over 3,500 members. So I would love to take the credit, but it's really the visionary work of Barry and Catherine that they did in this community that made all the difference. And the best thing is that they're genuinely nice people that I'm so happy to count as colleagues and friends. And I want to thank you for letting me be part of your story. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caitlin. And Caitlin, as she alluded to, is here representing uh, a lot of ATA presidents that we worked with. And I can remember when it first started out, they were just thinking, what, what are these two doing? <laughs> why is it a company? Why not an association? Yeah. And I got they have, a, they have an agenda. Members, and it took some time to figure out what we were trying to do and that, yes, we were really sincere in our efforts. Yeah. And once that was discovered, it was just full speed ahead. And we are exactly. so grateful. So, Caitlin, thank you so much. Thank you so and, much, Caitlin. Thank uh, you. Thank you to all of uh, Marjorie, Naomi, Caitlin, and Kristen for sharing their memories and voices from this early stage. It's for us to stay as close to on time as we possibly can. It's time for us to uh, move forward, and I'm going to share my screen again. And we're going to move on now to talk about the interpreter film. Um, Rob, you can go ahead and request the floor. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about this um, whole project. Again, we would see things that we were so excited and passionate about, and we figured, well, what can we do to help? In 2015, I came across a project to make actually a narrative film with script about an interpreter in Afghanistan. And it was Robert Hamm and Jenna Cavell that had put this together. There was a Kickstarter campaign. They had been published in IndieWire magazine and then the website. They were a project of the week, and they were being nominated for project of the year. And 
we just said, we've got to do something. So I ended up calling. I think I can't remember. If I talked to Robert or Jenna first, but we talked and we said, look, we can mobilize the interpreter community and we can get the, help you get this thing funded. And long story short, we were able to do it and we were able to make a contribution, a significant contribution to help them reach their goal. Now, the film hasn't been released yet. We're six years on. We understand all of that. But I want you to see the teaser trailer. This movie has gone from being a narrative film, Hollywood style, to something that I believe is actually more compelling. And that is a documentary based on the life, or not based on, the documentary showing the life of Robert's personal interpreter in Afghanistan when he was there as a combat videographer. And so we're going to run that just now. It's going to take me just one second. Bear with me as I bring this up. The U.S. has begun a major attack against the Taliban, the Al-Qaeda network in Afghanistan. My name is uh, Saif al -Hakma. I work for the U.S. Army Station and FOB. Southern host Afghanistan. The interpreters were like the eyes for the U.S. military in Afghanistan. The insurgent would all the time say that, kill those ears and eyes, cut that, and then they will be not. They were calling for a suicide bombers for jihad. Capture the uh, innocent people. They were killing them like, like chickens. The hundreds of Taliban, they were coming from all directions. And he said, Allahu Akbar. And he shot the rocket. I was receiving threats to me, my family, my father, brothers. And I was thinking that's the, the, the last moment of my life. The future of these kids is very uncertain and unknown. I'd like to introduce Robert Hamm, the uh, visionary director of Interpreters Wanted. Robert, if uh, you, you didn't know, is actually an Emmy Award-winning um, director and producer who focuses on um, a lot of different subjects but is very knowledgeable when it comes to um, military and uh, conflict. And so, Robert, would love to turn the time over to you so you can share a little bit more with us about the film and your vision behind it. Great. Um, well, first of all, Barry and Catherine, thank you for the opportunity to meet you all this morning and to be here and to share a little bit. And um, I want to thank all the Kickstarter donors and all the folks who supported this film since the beginning. I know it's been a long time coming, but I think it'll be worth it. Um, you know, sometimes uh, as older as wines get older, they get better, right? That's what, that's what I think that this project is going to be. And um, it's really come a long way, and I think it's going to be a, a great project and has helped heal my process of, of coming out of the war as well. Um, so let me give you some quick background on the whole story. You know, back in 2014, I was just getting out of the Army. I was a combat videographer, as Barry said, and had spent a deployment in Afghanistan, smaller deployments all over Asia, uh, many moves, married with two kids. Um, and I was now in the reserve. I would move back to Los Angeles, which is where I was originally from, and I was attending the University of Southern California uh, Cinematic Arts School, getting my master's in film, and just trying to move on from uh, military life and navigate the new world of this career I was getting myself into. And, you know, beginning to struggle with my own demons of the, of, of the war and, and my own experience. But uh, early that year in 2014, I get this desperate email from Saifala, um, my interpreter, who you see in that in that trailer, uh, who I had filmed quite a bit in Afghanistan, but had never imagined telling a story about an Afghan, interestingly. Um, you know, I was a so soldier. And, um, but he had his two visas uh, applications, and they were being denied. Not denied, but they were in limbo and a bureaucratic mess. And the Taliban were after him. You know, he was in complete isolation with his family and was desperate to get out um, of Afghanistan. So, of course, I don't know what the hell to do. You know, I'm just a film student. Um, don't have any political connections and just, you know, struggling to do my own thing. Um, and that's kind of where this crazy journey began. Um, it led me to try to raise money on Kickstarter. And that's where Barry came in. And I appreciate all of his help and support over the years. And, of course, my primary purpose was to raise awareness uh, for Saifullah's story and uh, the plight of the Afghan and the Iraqi translators. 
And we started helping during this time of trying to produce this film and everything. We started helping Seifolo write letters to congressmen and women. And, um, and his brother even filmed a video of him pleading for help. And I sent it all over. We got some help from No One Left Behind, which is a nonprofit organization that's also partnered with us. And uh, but things seem to be moving at such a snail pace, you know, and, but we just kept working and hoping. So happily, you know, in 2016, uh, after almost two and a half years of doing that, um, Saifla got his visa and he flew out and he came to San Antonio and I met him there. Um, and we filmed that whole experience. And it was just an extraordinary moment for me. I hadn't seen him in seven years. It was quite emotional. And I shortly realized that um, the film I really needed to make um, was not a Hollywoodized version of it, but the, the real version of Seifel's journey, because there was no other way to explain it than to just show what had really happened. You know, I had met Seifel. He was the head interpreter of a huge base, the largest army base on the border of Pakistan in 2009. It's where all the special forces guys went out of. It was the big uh, army base, lots of helicopters, lots of stuff going on. And he had already been serving there since 2004. You know, throughout that year, we really got to know each other and became uh, very, very close friends. Um, we even survived rocket attacks together and really, you know, worked hard to be successful at the mission, our mission, which was to communicate the story of what the NATO forces were doing there, right? What we're trying to do there. You know, it was uh, an extremely long year, uh, as you can imagine, um, violence and war all the time. Um, a soldier named Bo Bergdahl actually went missing that year. He was from our brigade, and we spent a lot of time looking for him. That's another film that I've been working on for a long time. Um, and we helped facilitate the elections that year, uh, and we were at the beginning of a surge that was coming. So it was, a, it was an interesting year. Um, and we lost some good soldiers and interpreters, you know, along the way. Um, but, you know, to get the, to the heart of this story, I had to go back even farther and really understand, you know, what it was to be an Afghan, what it was to be, you know, an interpreter from that time. You know, Saifullah grew up in the Soviet Union's brutal war against his people, which lasted around, you know, 10 years. Um, then after 10 years of war uh, with the Soviet Union, that led to the dark times of the Taliban's oppressive rule. You know, they were brutal upon the people. He was beaten multiple times for not following their religious rules. His father was blown up in an IED and lost his legs. Um, his family were constantly targeted for their democratic and more moderate Muslim worldview. You know, the threat of getting executed by decapitation uh, was a real and constant threat. I mean, they were just brutal. You know, and then, of course, the U.S. and NATO forces invade after 9-11 in 2001, and, and we're still there. It's the longest of America's wars. And Saifullah has spent his whole, you know, life there. But despite this, you know, Saifullah is hopeful, loving, kind, loyal, hardworking, resilient, brilliant English speaker, by the way. Speaks three other languages. It's a passion that drives him every day to be a better person. Um, and that passion has driven me to want to make this film and tell his story. You know, I've grown to love Saifullah as a brother, and I'm super excited to share this film with you guys. Um, it's been a long time coming, but I'm very proud of it, and um, I'm looking forward to hopefully helping more interpreters uh, get their visas and make it to America. And hopefully I could watch uh, this film with Saifullah and then watch our children play together in freedom. So that's my little story. Thank you guys for listening and sharing, and I can't wait to show you guys the film. Yeah, Rob, thanks so much. Um, it has been uh, a wonderful um, just experience, and we've learned a lot about how movies get made and sometimes don't get made, or, you know, it's, it's, it's a long and winding road, but uh, we're coming very close to the end of it. And what I want to let everybody know is that although Interpret America is uh, – you know, closing up shop, we are still going to be supporting uh, Robert and working with him to ensure that there are screenings of the film uh, in different venues and at different conferences in the language industry, because we feel that this is an extremely important message to get out. So, Rob, thanks so much. Catherine, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you, too, and, you know, thank you for being persistent and keeping the film moving forward as well. And I also wanted to just acknowledge that, you know, this was one of the first times that our community came together and really fundraised 
in a in a global way for an effort that you know to highlight um, this issue. And so I I wanted to thank all everybody who donated to that campaign that's helped you know fund it. And to like we really wanted to let you know that even though five years has passed, that money didn't just go into the you know the S ether. It it's been being used to support the creation of the film. And so your donations are are you know uh, achieving their goal. And thank you, Rob. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, it, it's, it's definitely an international story, right? Yeah. I mean, this is, this affects so many people. So thank you guys, too. Thank you. Well, Rob, you can go ahead and uh, click on Release Mic, and you can go back into the audience. Thank you again so much. Now, we're going to be switching now to an issue of um, technology, which is my favorite. But before we do that, I need to do something. Um, some of you may notice that I have on a yellow tie today. Um, there's just a little ritual that I, I don't know how it even started, but it started with the first conference. Actually, I was in D.C. the night before, and I went into a store, and I thought, I'm going to buy myself a new tie to feel like a million bucks. So I bought this nice yellow tie. And so from then on, before every Interpret America Summit, I would buy a yellow tie. <laughs> And so I now have a yellow tie that represents, and this one has a little stain on it, you see. There's another one that has spaghetti on it. Um, and I have a tie, a yellow tie for every summit out there. And for Gala, just so you know, I still have my orange tie. But just one of those little things that I did, and my daughter went out to help me find a tie, um, a yellow tie. But believe it or not, we didn't find any we liked, so I ordered one on Amazon. So it's nice, plain, and simple. One of the fun things we did, but let me go and ahead. You can see my gala orange scarf. It was the one time, it's the only time we ever color coordinated, and so I wore it in honor for that today as well. Very nice. So just to share screens here again, we're going to move on now and talk a little bit about technology. It became uh, my biggest focus within Interpret America because I, one, saw what was bearing down on the profession. I felt like it was going to come, and if we didn't get in front of it, the wave could potentially crush us. And as Catherine has pointed out many times, if there's anything we've learned over the last year, 10 years, it's that we ignore technology to our own peril. So um, for us to talk about technology, well, we had to ask that question. And this takes us to the uh, interpreting marketplace study that was done by CSA Research. Um, back in 2010, we worked very closely with Natalie Kelly and her team, who was the chief research officer at the time, and put together a very detailed questionnaire, not only for interpreters, but also for agencies, um, language service companies, and end users. And, and this was our big leap, right? This was, there was no research, there was no research across the field of interpreting. There was one agency, one market research company focused mostly on translation. And with Natalie Kelly's support and advocacy, we did commission this and it was the first of its kind and still almost kind of the only of its kind because it's still available publicly. <laughs> yeah. Right? And yep. it, that, that is correct. And it's, we ended up giving this away to the profession free of charge. And it's still available today openly for anybody to download and take a look at. But this study actually served later on for advocacy and other things when we had the fight with uh, AB5 in California. They needed hard data, not just stories. And we were able to pull hard data out of this report, although it was a few years old. And there's also a really interesting thing. In the second summit, uh, Natalie talked about technology trends in the interpreting marketplace. And um, in the market uh, study that, that was done by CSA Research, um, I want you to take a look at these. These are the views of interpreters and of suppliers, i.e. Um, what we were referring to, this is what we use to refer to language service companies. And how likely do you think technology is to affect the interpreting profession within the following time periods? One year, as you can see, very likely was green. Five years it grew. Ten years, three-quarters of interpreters believed that it would have a significant impact on the profession. Wow, how prescient they were, because ten years later, well, here we are. Same thing with those working uh, in language service companies. In fact, more of them, 77.3%, saw that 
technology would have a huge impact on us in about 10 years later. So if we look at our crystal ball gazing, um, as a profession, we actually did pretty good. I don't think any of us could have imagined that it would come the way it did last year with the pandemic. Now, as I had mentioned, um, Natalie was one of our biggest supporters, and we would like to just share a message that she recorded and sent from Donegal, Ireland, to share with you here today. So I'm going to go ahead and cue this up. It'll take me just one second. Hi, Barry. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Introvert America friends. Uh, Natalie Kelly here. I just wanted to provide a quick reflection that I hope uh, will be helpful in thinking about the, com the contribution that Interpret America has made for the interpreting profession. I remember when we first did the marketplace study in the initial year of Interpret America's launch, uh, thinking this is really something big and this is something important that Barry and Catherine are working on. And then in seeing what happened in the years after that, you know, bringing people together and providing a forum for thought leadership and connectedness uh, throughout the different, very siloed aspects of the profession, I think was so, so important back then and uh, today. And now, you know, I'm here in Ireland all these years later during the middle of a pandemic <laughs> and uh, taking this video selfie style. Uh, and it just really drives home how much change has taken place in the years since Interpret America was launched and how important that change was to give way to the time we're in now. You know, granted, the pandemic has been hard. I'm filming this in between, you know, uh, pandemic homeschooling of my two small kids and doing my job at HubSpot. Uh, and life in general relocating to another country during this time. But, you know, there's a lot of good that has come out of the pandemic, a greater awareness of the fact that we can connect across barriers of location and language. We can remove barriers of access for people. You know, it's amazing to me to see how so many more people are able to obtain access to services and opportunities and information as a result of this forced situation, uh, the ultimate stress test of, okay, how can we truly open up access? And I think that is what is great about Interpret America providing a forum so many years ago to those initial discussions about how technology could change the interpreting profession. And I am so proud to see how much of that has actually come true in the years since we worked on that marketplace study together. And I was so privileged and proud to be a part of it. And I'm really, really grateful that I had the chance. And even though I'm no longer directly employed in the interpreting profession right now, I'm very much connected to the language industry and the translation and interpreting community at large. And I just want to give you my biggest thank you, Barry and Catherine, and everyone who's been part of the Interpret America movement for all the groundbreaking work that you have done to get us to this place where we are truly prepared to take on the next challenges. So thank you for including me and um, wishing you the best from Ireland. I know we'll stay in touch and I can't wait to see what is ahead on this journey. Thank you. And thank you, Natalie. That was wonderful. Now, I've got another video I want to share with you actually from her keynote address from 2011 when she was talking about the interpreting marketplace and technology. And she gave one of the first looks into what was actually happening with AI, with remote interpreting and those technologies. And she was able to get an interview with Ray Kurzweil. Ray Kurzweil, for those of you who don't know that name, is a noted futurist, and he was the inventor of the keyboard synthesizer, the Kurzweil synthesizer. And it was revolutionary in the early 80s because it changed music forever. Those of us who are children of the 80s will remember that all that synthesized pop music came out because of the synthesizer. And that was Ray Kurzweil. Ray is currently the head of engineering, the director of engineering at Google. And Natalie asked him specifically about technology and would technology replace interpreters and should interpreters fear that possibility? And 
there's about a three minute response from Ray that we I'd love to share with you now. And I want you to think about his response as he talks about what happened in the music industry with the introduction of a new technology and how he thought he could extrapolate that to the language services industry. So here we go. Well, I don't think these technologies so much replace whole fields uh, in general, what what they do is replace perhaps a certain way of applying them. I mean, think about music, which is an area I've worked in. Uh, we introduced some synthesizers in the 1980s that could accurately recreate the sounds of orchestral instruments. And so the Musicians Union actually uh, protested this, saying, we're all going to lose our jobs because we got these guys and they're playing horns uh, for this television commercial, and and now they hired, they used your synthesizer, and and they didn't get those gigs, and that was right, they didn't get those gigs, but musicians got different gigs uh, using the technology. And if you go to a music conference now, like National Association of Music Merchants, it's like a computer conference with these very powerful musical tools where musicians can command a whole orchestra and, and so forth, and actually do a lot more with the technology. And in fact, music is more vibrant than ever, and musicians are very much in demand. And now, for example, a documentary that might have used uh, recorded music because they couldn't afford an orchestra will hire original human musicians with the with synthesizers to create an orchestral soundtrack, and it's a new opportunity that didn't exist before. So I think uh, the opportunities will change. Uh, you know, if your business model is, I'm only going to do this one task that's now in demand, that, that task may go away. But I think the demand for language is going to increase, and these tools are going to increase humans' ability, with the help of these machines, to command greater uh, ability to use language. And it's very hard to anticipate what that will be like. I mean, most of the jobs in the world today didn't exist at all 50 years ago. If I were a Prussian futurist in 1900, I would say, okay, well, a third of you work on farms and a third of you work in factories, but I predict in 100 years, in the year 2000, it's going to be 3% and 3%. And everybody would go, oh, my God, I'm, we're going to be out of work. And I'd say, well, don't worry, you'll get jobs as uh, web designers and you'll be translating online conversations. And nobody would know what I was talking about. And most of the jobs today didn't exist then or even a few decades ago. Uh, so that's going to happen with language translation. I think uh, that's actually the most high-level type of work one can imagine, because I think the epitome of human intelligence is our ability to command language. That is why Alan Turing based the Turing test, which is a test of whether or not a computer is operating at human levels. He based it on a command of language. And these tools are going to as they do now, and they're going to increase our ability to use and create and understand and manipulate and translate language. And the idea is not to resist the tools, but to use them to do more. And I think what we've seen already in the music field is a good model of that. Great words to think about. And uh, I think that those words were also very prescient 10 years ago when we first heard them. So to wrap up our part on technology, I think... It would not be complete if we weren't to just take a moment to revisit a panel discussion on our first panel discussion on remote technologies and interpreting and uh, take a listen to some now immortal words in our profession. So bear with me one moment as I pull up that video. Um the question comes up, will they be replaced by technology? And I think the answer to that is the interpreters will never be replaced by technology. They will be replaced by interpreters who use technology. And I think it's essential to retain uh, that point. And that's right. We couldn't agree more. It was great to be able to pull up that video and remember that wonderful seminal conference in 2011, 10 years ago, and uh, to hear those words from Bill Wood.
So I need to bring Catherine back on now that we've finished with the videos. And we're going to be moving on now um, to do a, another quick Mentimeter poll. So I'm going to share my screen here quickly. And uh, again, you will go to uh, menti.com, 70126063. And I will pull that up right now and we'll move on to the next one. Share your favorite Interpret America memory. And what we're going to do here, I think, Catherine, is we'll leave this open and encourage you to write in your memories. We're a little bit behind schedule, and we'd like to stay on schedule as much as we possibly can. So if you can share those memories, uh, it's just for Catherine and us to take a look at them, and we can make those available. And we can show it at the very end as well. Yeah, and, we can and, do and, that. And we'll be sharing all this out as well. I mean, I just, you know, we're not... Even though this particular, you know, Interpret America is not going to move forward the way it was, we're not pulling down our website, we're not pulling down our videos, we're going to leave everything available as, as the legacy there, and we'll continue to communicate out the final, um, you know, these final products. So I see the answers starting to come in. Uh, so, oh, I can't wait to see these, Barry. <laughs> it's going to be yeah, a real treat to see these. Yeah. yeah, so please just go ahead and drop those in. We'll leave this open as we continue with our program. And so what I need to do now is, I think, get back to our slide program, our slide chart. Yeah. And, and I have to thank Barry because of the way that, you know, Barry's the one in charge of all this back and forth and back and forth. So you're showing the true interpreter's ability to multitask across many elements. Right now, <laughs> definitely. So many elements. Thank so you. Catherine, for I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, so now we're moving, we're going to move on to sort of the really first, um, really significant collaboration that we undertook with the Globalization and Localization Association because, you know, starting in 2014. Prior to that, we had really focused a lot on the profession side and the practitioner side and on, on a side that we were all used to sort of working around. And we began to realize that we were kind of talking to ourselves. And so, you know, if, if perhaps we had may helped, you know, the, for field, the profession progress a little bit in getting to know each other, there was a whole side that was nobody that wasn't really talking to practitioners, and that was the whole business side. And so uh, Barry actually had, you can tell your moment here, you tell it better, just how the whole idea for Think Interpreting began, and then we're going to bring on Allison Furch um, from Gala. Well, I'm going to keep it short and just yep. say that I was uh, in Kiev, Ukraine, for a speaking engagement at the first UTIC conference, and Hans Fenstermacher, who was at the head of Gala at that time, um, he and I decided to go out and enjoy some good Ukrainian food, and over a lot of great rye bread, um, pilmeni, and a whole lot of other things, um, we said, well, you know, if these parts of the industry aren't talking to each other, why don't we do something to help them talk about it? And he talked about, well, we could create something within Gala and you could curate that track or that mini conference. And I said, yeah, let me talk to my business partner about it. And here we are, seven Think Interpretings later. So if you advance the slide, yeah, we have, we've had seven Think Interpreting events. And I just want to show the next slide before we bring um, Allison on, because for me, this was, this has been one of the truly, uh, mind expanding and profession expanding experiences and opportunities in my lifetime was getting to be part of this think interpreting because I got to go over onto the industry side and go to those conferences and really begin to understand what company owners and language service companies are doing and focusing on and you know we're, we're two sides of one coin and we're so often portrayed as us versus them and if there's any message that we want to continue to you know send out is that that's no it's all in us um but i was just sort of showing that these are some of the titles you you, you, you end up talking about things a little bit differently because you're talking to company the people who are trying to bring the services to you and we just had an amazing slate of speakers and panels and um, experiences over the years at gala uh, and you know you can go back and look at our website and see what some of those events included but for now what we really want to do is get allison up um, she is the current head of gala and uh they are continuing their work, and has, she, I know that she's had to go through those incredible challenges of taking entire years of one of the first conferences to cancel and have to go remote right at the pandemic, right at the pandemic would yeah. bore down on you. So what a year you've had. Thank you for coming, and we just would love to hear what you have to say. <laughs> well, it's my pleasure, um, and thank you for, for having me on today. I 
I think there are three themes that are coming out for me and that also summarize our, our collaboration. And they are foresight, um, risk taking, and then professionalism. And I think we saw some of those words in the word cloud earlier. I also like what Marjorie said, like her metaphor about the tapestry. And she talked about bringing together maybe the linguists and, and the different specialties. But I think that what we were able to accomplish with Think Interpreting was, like you said, bringing in the business side. Um, Hans and Barry showed quite a bit of foresight, I would say, um, in that day, and I think it was 2013, when they decided to, um, actually, it started out as a business arrangement, right? We were, um, there were profit sharing, and it was a business deal. And um, from that, I think it, it really grew into mutual trust and um, friendship. So um, they took a risk, you know, Barry and Catherine uh, alluded a few times to alienating their core audience who thought, you know, you're associating with business. They're the bad guys. I think someone else, maybe Caitlin referred to um, industry as bottom dwellers. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> um, the point is that you took a risk in doing that, but I think the payoff was really um, meaningful and it's being, it's still being seen today, at least from the business side, I can say that. So thank you for taking that risk. I'm glad we jumped in with you. Um, we had some really great conferences and it was just like your tagline says, a, a mission to raise the profile of interpreting. And we had companies within our uh, organization and community that were doing interpreting, but it wasn't a topic we talked about all that much. And that's what Think Interpreting enabled us to do was to bring this topic to the forefront and get people talking about it. Um, yes, we focused more on technology and operations than concerns of the linguist, but that's the nature of what Gala does and what uh, who our audience is. Um, professionalism was just uh, exceptional. Somebody else mentioned how you were always so prepared, and I would say I felt that too. We got to travel the world together, meet up in really cool cities around the world, you know, Boston and New York, Amsterdam, um, Sevilla, Munich, and I'm glad that we were we were on that journey together. I have a lot of memories of like late nights in the staff office with you guys. Um, so what I want to say for Gala, the enduring legacy that Interpret America has is that we've really brought interpreting into Gala's DNA. Um, it was evident at the beginning of the pandemic. Catherine alluded to us having to make this major pivot. And one of the first online kind of special sessions that we did was about uh, business continuity in the interpreting sector with Barry uh, on the Kudo platform. Um, and now I'm happy to say that we're launching our interpreting and interpreting technology Technologies SIG special interest group with our first meeting next week. So I want to say thank you for collaborating with Gala. Um, I wish you all the best in the next endeavors, and I know we'll remain in each other's orbits. So I look forward to working together again in another capacity. Definitely, Alice. Definitely, Allison. Thank, thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much. All right. I'm going to just quickly share screen here again as we transition to the next segment. If you look at the circle here, and nope. you look who's... Yeah. You just need to move the slide forward, that's all. I'm going to get there in just one okay, second. Perfect. I just Sorry. wanted to point out something. No, if you look at where um, uh, we are standing and sitting here, next to us is Gonzalo Celorio Moraita, who became a big... Um, supporter of Interpret America and also one of our closest collaborators. So take it away, Catherine. All right. So now we're going to move on to Linguist, which is really one of my, turned out to be just one of the most amazing collaborations that we've done. And uh, why don't you go ahead? We're going to have Gonzalo Solorio Moray to come oh, speak wait. to us in a moment. But just to give a little bit of background for, go ahead and you can go to the next slide. Um, you know, Linguist really was the brainchild of Gonzalo, who had been attending um, some of the Interpret America events, he's based in Mexico City and owns a company there and runs a foundation. And he came up to us, and I think it was in uh, 2016, and said, hey, Barry and Catherine, I want to talk to you for a minute, and pulled us aside and said, I really want to do something like Interpret America in Mexico for the Mexican interpreting profession, which was very split between, you know, the very visible and sort of standard mainstream profession that we're all used to and a very growing and urgent uh, community indigenous interpreting profession that was coming to the fore. And so 
you know, we agreed to collaborate and um, it has been one of the most magical and wonderful collaborations that we've done. And I think we have one more slide. Is that correct? Or on this before we move over to Gonzalo? Um, I, this, I just wanted to, I had to show the slide because I don't know what it is or what the secret sauce is exactly. Um, we put together and sort of this amazing event that's one day of plenary kind of interpret america style and then two days of just really intensive and high quality training in translation and interpreting in, in english and spanish offered and it just was magical that both on-site conferences were magical and it spawned a lot of other efforts and i just i want gonzalo to speak to it but there was something about this that just really moves me more than anything that what we were able to accomplish with linguists and and hope to continue to accomplish <clears throat> And we can't quite hear you, so, nope. And Barry, you're muted too, so. I am muted. Gonzalo, your mic is muted. There, okay. we go. there you go. Excellent. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Barry. Uh, we're all about multilingualism. Multilingual, ugh, we're all about multilingualism. So I will speak in Spanish and make our interpreters work. Remember that the language selector is on the bottom corner and select the English to listen to our great interpreters. No hay manera de que pueda hablar nada más tres minutos si no tengo algo preparado y conozco a Barry lo suficientemente bien para saber que me va a carrerear. Así que mejor voy a leer y solo hablaré tres minutos y veintidós segundos. Por favor, no me cortes, Barry. Me perdí la primera cumbre de Interpret America porque me enteré demasiado tarde, pero asistí a la segunda en la que se acuñó la icónica frase que decía que la tecnología no reemplazaría a los intérpretes, pero que los intérpretes que supieran utilizar la tecnología reemplazarían a los que no. Y eso antes de que supiéramos que los pocos años habría una pandemia. No me cabe duda que Interpret America preparó al gremio para la revolución que desencadenó el COVID. En 2012 me inscribí con un exceso de optimismo, pues al día siguiente de la clausura empezaba en México el G20 y yo estaba coordinando a los intérpretes para ese evento. Por supuesto que tuve que cancelar mi participación en Interpret America, pero Barry me dio todos los detalles cuando llegó a interpretar a los cabos. No creo haberme perdido en ninguna otra de las cumbres, y fue mi experiencia en Interpret America la que me inspiró para definir el camino que habría de tomar la Fundación Italia Moraita. Interpret America me abrió los ojos sobre la equidad e inequidad que existía entre los distintos sectores de la interpretación, particularmente entre la interpretación de conferencias y la interpretación comunitaria. De ahí surgió la iniciativa de crear actividades que permitieran, primero a las distintas generaciones de un mismo sector y después a los distintos grupos de la industria que nos une, a conocerse, a aprender unos de otros y a colaborar. El hito fue Lenguas, un proyecto conjunto entre Interpret America y la Fundación Italia Moraita que buscaba, por un lado, ofrecer oportunidades de capacitación transversalmente a los integrantes de la industria y por el otro reunir bajo un mismo techo a agencias, intérpretes y traductores, a profesionales que trabajaban con lenguas extranjeras y con lenguas indígenas nacionales. Creo que realmente logramos incentivar la educación continua en México y tuvimos mucho éxito en reunir tanto a las cabezas de las asociaciones nacionales e internacionales de las distintas ramas de la industria como a los profesionales que la integran. Dado que la pandemia ha promovido una enorme oferta de capacitación en línea y que nuestro objetivo principal es la interacción entre representantes de distintos campos de la industria, decidimos no llevar a cabo Lenguas 2021, pero esperamos contar con Barry y Catherine en la siguiente edición, independientemente de Interpret America. El estudio de Interpret America sobre interpretación en Estados Unidos también sirvió de inspiración para el exitoso estudio de la encuesta sobre la traducción en interpretación en México que la Fundación Italia Moraita realizó con la colaboración de Interpret America hace algunos años y que pensamos repetir en el futuro cercano para poder comparar la industria antes y después del COVID. Para cerrar, quisiera decir cuál ha sido la aportación más importante de Interpret America para mí. El descubrimiento de dos personas maravillosas con quienes he entablado una entrañable amistad. Gracias, Catherine. Gracias, Barry. Muchísimo éxito en lo que siga. Thank you so much, Gonzalo. And uh, Barry, I think, are you going to put on the video? Yeah. Okay. So gonna... Thank you, Gonzalo, yeah. as well. And we're going to share just a quick video so that you can see the magic of Lenguas. And it is our sincere hope that Lenguas is going to 
um, come back when the time is right, because it is an amazing, amazing conference. As you can see, Languis was truly a magical, magical conference. Um, and one thing we forgot to mention is that the first one in 2017 took place shortly after the devastating uh, earthquake that hit Mexico City. After. <laughs> right. I mean, and people yeah. and we decided not to cancel and people still came. And I just, the final thing I that for me was that what's so moving to me about those images you just saw were the number of actual indigenous language trainers and speakers who are up on the stage and in the classrooms and teaching around those topics. I don't think I've ever seen that anywhere else in the world. And it, for me, it's one of the most moving parts of what the conference is able to do. So agreed. we're moving on to our final segment. We're about five minutes behind schedule and we're so grateful for you hanging in there with us. It's time to talk about advocacy, which is a huge topic that uh, is going to be with us for the foreseeable future. Catherine, I'm going to turn it over to you and ask Lorena and Bill to go ahead and request the floor. Well, let's do this one together because this is something we've both done from the beginning. I think for me, you know, right at the very beginning, the very first conference which we did, which was only one day long, we had two sessions dedicated to advocacy. Um, one was uh, you know, around language access laws at the time, just trying to get everybody to understand the law that we were swimming in that many of us were not aware of. And then we also had a Capitol Hill lobbyist who was not in the language side, but who was a lobbyist start to walk us through what it would look like to advocate for our profession. And it was just something we weren't talking about, although as you'll see, you know, Bill Rivers was already working in the arena. But for us, it was always clear from the very get-go that if we could not make ourselves be seen and understood, um, that it was a huge detriment to our profession. And we saw that play out even unfortunately over and over and over again the last year with the AB5 issue. It's still a really urgent issue for us. So um, Bear, I, I'll let you introduce, I think, because I want you to add whatever thoughts you have, but advocacy has been just one of the most important pieces of what we've tried to do. That is for sure, and it's going to remain a very important piece. Um, from the very first conference where we hired, um, actually didn't hire, he came in, he was a dear friend, still is a dear friend of mine, who has worked in government representation for 30 years. He came in and gave us an initial presentation on how you actually go and lobby your government about issues. And that's how it all began. 
Um, and I will just quickly show uh, one slide for you to see um, the fruit of the many labors that have taken place over the last decade. You can see the publications that have come about and the efforts that have gone on in order to advocate for the profession in so many ways at the federal level in the United States and also at the state level and people who were involved in it. So it's really amazing to see all of this gathered together on one slide for me because when you're in it, you don't realize um, how all of this does add up. So as they say, you know, small steps can lead to great progress. So having said that, um, I would just say that it has been a very important issue for us, and uh, Bill was the one that brought us into JNCL Nicholas and got us to start advocating at the federal level and basically learning what it took to be able to advocate successfully for the profession. And so um, we just want to start, Bill, with you, give you three minutes, and then we're going to talk a little bit more, um, give the floor to Lorena um, to really ground us in some stuff that has been happening in the last year um, and talk about how uh, advocacy matters and about Interpret America. So, Bill, we'll turn it over to you. Well, thanks. And um, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Go right ahead. Uh, my first, I was at that first summit. I was not yet at the Joint National Committee for Languages. I was with the National Language Service Corps as a contractor in the industry, um, then with JNCL, and now in um, in a different role as a as a independent consultant and lobbyist. And what I've seen, and it echoes a lot of what other people have said, um, bringing the the interpreting profession together, the different verticals that we have, has been actually critical for advocacy. You know, in the United States, it's your First Amendment right to petition the government for a redress of grievances, to ask your elected officials from the city, the town council, up to the president and the Congress to do their jobs and to, to act on your behalf. But you need to also bring that to everyone else in the community and advocate within your own community to get everyone together, to energize people, to make sure we're all singing from the same hymnal, if not the same exact page. There were a lot of challenges in the last uh, 10 years with with languages and language access and interpreting. Um, obviously, the 1099 W-2 issue, independent contractors, Lorraine is going to address at some length. Um, the special visa program that Rob Hamm talked about and the difficulty of getting the State Department to actually execute that or to even allocate the requisite number of visas. We had some success in the latter part of the Obama administration of at least increasing the flow of visas, but that was obviously shut down in the last administration. And then, you know, you look forward, um, and Interpret America has participated in uh, the Joint National Committee for Languages Advocacy Days for 10 years, for 9 or 10 years in ATA advocacy events and ALC advocacy events. But when we look forward, we see um, some immediate issues. Obviously, the special visa program needs to be addressed again. Um, the, the 1099, the independent contractor issue. But, you know, we have a real opportunity, and I want to in encourage people to stay engaged if you're in the states. We have a real opportunity with the incoming uh, Democratic Congress, which is now here, and the Democratic presidency of, of Joe Biden to get language access declared a medical necessity under the Medicare Act, Medicaid Act, under the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. And what that would mean for a significant part of the interpreting community is that medical interpreting would be reimbursable. And I will say that in terms of coming together, it's been very heartening to watch. It's been reflected that the ripples move out. I've watched how the standards community, ASTM F43 in the US, um, ISO Technical Committee 37, Subcommittee 5 at the international level, is much more inclusive and much more thoughtful about um, dealing with community interpreting and legal interpreting and medical interpreting and not, not just one model of interpreting. For those of us who work in lower density languages, and I was a Russian English and English Russian interpreter at the beginning of my career more than 30 years ago, you often end up taking whatever assignments you get. Sure, you're going to do conference one day, you know, one week for NASA and Institut Kosmicki Sledovanya, and the next week you're in a hospital doing uh, medical interpreting. And then the week after that, you're doing court or community interpreting because that's how life is for people in low density languages. And so seeing that reflected in the way Interpret America has worked has been not just heartening, but it has had a, a real impact on our ability to advocate for the profession. 
That's wonderful, Bill. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. So, Catherine, I'm going to let you introduce Lorena because you've been working so closely with her over the last year. <laughs> um, and I, when I made my transition in May to the private sector, um, you know, I and I wasn't living in California anymore. So, although I was involved initially in the efforts to uh, try to repeal AB5, I then had to step away. So, please, it's all yours. I mean, I, Lorena is just, she's actually a former Ms. graduate, and that's kind of how we were in each other's orbits. But really, I got to know Lorena because um, she is single-handedly in California been the person, I mean, I know lots of people worked with you, but Lorena, you are the one who just, on every single, she would pay attention to every single bill that would come up and anything that was going to impact or degrade or denigrate. So the, the little bit of a position we interpreters had in a legislative sense in California, she was always on top of it, always lobbying, always pulling us in and say, can you write a position? Can you help us here? Can you help us do that? So I just have gotten to know Lorena over the years with her incredible work. She's incredible, actually, how much, she, how hard she works on that. And when the AB5 gig workers bill came through, which for those who aren't part of uh, the U.S. audience, it was basically a law that made it almost impossible for freelance interpreters and translators to work in California as freelancers. Um, and so we put our efforts together and, and to, to try and get that bill changed and amended or fixed, which in the end we were able to do. And that's our that's what we're talking about when we say AB5. So I'm going to let Lorena go say what you want to say, but it's just been amazing. You've taught me what it means to advocate. Um, and now you are an ETA board member and leading advocacy efforts at a national level, and that's wonderful. So. All right. Wow. Well, thank, thank you so much, Catherine, for, for those kind words. You know, um, Honestly, I view Interpret America as the original advocacy entity for interpreters. Um, I think that just like many of the other speakers that have spoken before me, and it's a tough act to follow, you know, you've had amazing collaborators with Interpret America, but, uh, you know, from Kristen Quinlan saying that she was super interested because she didn't want to be considered bottom feeders anymore, uh, Naomi talking about how uh, finally a platform to explain this obscure profession that we're in. Caitlin Walsh, I mean, I think she said it perfectly, revolutionary, you know, bringing all of the different siloed um, uh, vectors of our, of our interpreting profession together. Um, and then Natalie, also Natalie Kelly saying that Interpret America provided this, this thought forum for technology to play a role in language access and look at where we are right now with the pandemic. So I don't know, to me, honestly, you guys really represent this original advocacy entity that brought together all the stakeholders, right? And not only um, within our profession, but also the entrepreneurs, the language companies, um, big, small, all of us. And when it comes to advocacy, you gave us a forum when I was with the California War Comp Interpreters Association way back in, I think it was Interpret America 5, you know, when we were dealing with this legislation in 2013 that sought to impose uh, regulations on workers' comp interpreters, which, by the way, is one of the largest providers of work for interpreters, the workers' comp field. Um, so you gave us a forum to come and speak about that and inform people, inform agencies, inform language companies, and also practitioners about how to speak up for themselves. Um, getting out the messaging, messaging throughout this last year with the AV5 situation, as you mentioned, was just crucial. I mean, it was key because obviously Interpret America has such a humongous reach, right? And I'm going to miss you guys terribly. I mean, I, I totally get it, and I honor your your desire to, to bring a close to this because you did accomplish your goal of elevating the profile of interpreting, not only in our country, but in the world. And what I would like to see is for everybody on this, this webinar today and those who are listening in, to it, to the recording, is I want to ask you, what are you going to do in your little part of the world to keep this momentum going, to keep this movement going, to advocate on your local level, your state level, your national level, to continue elevating the profile for interpreters so that we can do our work with dignity and justice and provide meaningful language access for everybody across the board, from the highest of the high to the lowest of the low, you know, and I know, I know that you all know what I mean when I say that. So 
thank you so much, Catherine and Barry, for everything that you've done for us. And yeah, it's not the end. We're going to keep collaborating, but thank you so much for this, this venture. Thank you, Lorena. Thank you so much. And I don't think she could have teed that up any nicer for us yeah. than she did. So I'm going to go right into this and we're going to go back to Mentimeter. If you would go to menti.com, 7012663 is the code. And what are you going to do to raise the profile of interpreting as we move forward? Please share some of your ideas with us. That was um, our last thought that we had before we were going to close up. So, Lorraine, exactly. you really, you anticipated that beautifully. <laughs> so, I would encourage you to think about that and include some of those um, uh, in the uh, mentee. Get more involved with the TNI Association. Excellent idea. Promote yeah, and I just, I just yeah, have to ahead. say, I was just going to say that as people are filling this out, that, you know, for me, it's just been the most humbling part of my professional career is it is through the collaboration and the and being involved in the broad, the bigger organizations the organizations that you know are are working for your field that my entire career opportunity is based on that joining professional associations going to conferences raising my hand to volunteer for something and then with interpret america you know putting on events it it just has led it, it is what grows our profession. And so I just thank you. I want to thank everyone who's been here and who is involved. And I know everybody's individual efforts that you're showing here um, are, cr are critical. Like we just have to keep going, stay involved, keep working at it, what, whatever organization is the one for you, and, you know, because that is, that is why we can raise our profile and become the respected profession and seen and understood and valued and paid, well-paid profession that we want to have. Definitely. Thank you for writing those things. We'll have you continue to do that. Um, I'm going to uh, move to another slide that you should all see here. As we wrap up, we're just about eight minutes over time, so I think that's about what we had expected. The road ahead is one that is full of opportunity, challenge, and um, just great opportunities. And so I encourage um, all of you to, you know, think what it is that, that you can do to assist um, the profession. Um, I guess I just want to wrap up and say thank you. Thank you to everyone who has supported us over these many years. Um, I want to thank my business partner, Catherine Allen, who has um, just been a great compliment to my strengths and my weaknesses as we have worked to do all of these things. Um, it's, it's been amazing, but I need to make one um, special thank you. Um, I, being a part, being a, a conference interpreter and being part of Interpret America has meant a lot of late night writing sessions, a lot of work, a lot of travel, um, and I want to thank my dear wife, Julieta, for supporting me unequivocally from start to finish. She has always been there, even when it has been hard, because I have been away. And so I just want to say that, you know, there's no way I could have ever done any of this if I had not had the support of my dear wife. So um, I invited her to connect. I haven't been able to look at the list to see if she did. I'm hoping that she has connected today. So that's how I want to wrap things up and say thank you. I am not disappearing. I am going to continue. My role has just changed. And I am now able to have a direct impact on a platform that interpreters use. And I'm going to continue to work to improve it, perfect it, and make it so that interpreters continue to have an important role in the 21st century. Catherine, you can wrap it up. Yeah, <laughs> you're going to get it through. You're going to make it through without completely choking up. So well, I first, I actually have to thank you, Barry, because you are the one who called me into your office at the Monterey Institute, now Middlebury Institute, um, you know, as we, I was finishing out my master's degree and say, hey, you know, you're, you're over there on the community interpreting and healthcare interpreting side, and I'm doing this, and I have this crazy idea, and what do you think? And I have been pushed so far out of my comfort zone on this journey with Interpret America. I've done so many things I would never have thought possible or done, and and I and you have been the perfect partner. So I do want to say thank you for you know supporting me in my weaknesses and building up my strengths, and and for the just 
the proof of what can be done, um, you know, when you, when you collaborate. I also want to thank Julieta and also my family. We've been through a lot of different family moments together um, for, for all the support I've had through the years. And, and I guess I just want to thank the interpreting community for allowing us to occupy this space, for allowing us to lead in the way that we felt like we had something to offer um, for the support and for everything you do. I'm also not going anywhere. Um, I will be launching out my own new platform or identity, I guess, you know, in the next month or so. Um, but we're just us. We're still doing the same things and we'll continue to, you know, do whatever we can to help the profession grow, you know, as we go along. But it's been a true, true honor. <laughs> it's just such a closing of a chapter. Thank you so much. Thank you. And so with that, we want to thank everyone because it's been an amazing ride. The website's still going to be out there. Um, we're going to leave uh, the room open. I'm going to make sure that I uh, get a copy of all the chat stream to be able to catch up on that. Um, would be happy to, to chat with anybody for a few minutes that wants to hang on um, because uh, you guys made all of this possible. So thank you so much, and uh, I look forward to seeing you either online or in person, hopefully in the not-so-distant future. Yep, and, and with that, it's, it's a wrap, isn't it, Barry? A wrap. <laughs> it's a wrap. Thanks, thank you, everybody.